Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have a few people still joining, but I'll let them in as and when. Um, just for the sake of time, we'll kick off. Um, so yeah, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you all here with us today for a brand new webinar from MedAct, Nuclear Militarization, How It Threatens Humanity, presented by Dr. Frank Bolton of MedAct's Nuclear Weapons Group. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Sarah. I'm the Peace and Security Campaigner at MedAct. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll just offer a brief introduction before we commence. Um, for those of you who are, who are unfamiliar with MedAct's work, we're a UK-based charity for global health, working on issues related to peace and security, climate and environment, economic justice and human rights. This webinar has been developed for health workers, students and anyone committed to health justice or broadly the cause for nuclear disarmament. Um, so whether you've come to MedAct through all of our different uh, pieces of work uh, or are very, very much new to the movement, you're very welcome. Um, this evening is a launch event for the web for the newest briefing, um, and you'll be able to watch this webinar back as it is being recorded. Um, we'll hear from Dr. Frank Bolton shortly, and then we'll have about 15 minutes towards the end of the webinar for questions. So really encourage you all to, to think about any questions you might have, any things you'd like to explore further, or just have clarifications on. No question is too small, so please feel free to either drop them in the chat, send them to myself, or to TJ, who's going to be doing tech support for us during the call as well. Uh, if you have any tech issues during the call, just drop an email to office at medact.org. I'll put that into the chat shortly as well. Um, and yeah, I'll just offer a quick introduction to Frank Bolton, who is a member of Medact's Nuclear Weapons Group and a founding member of the Medical Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons. Um, he, was he was a retired NHS consultant physician in hematology and is currently a clinical teacher at Southampton University. He co-authored MEDAC's 2011 report, Preventing Torture, the Role of Physicians and Their Professional Organizations, and has published on nuclear weapons and peace issues in journals, including The Lancet and BMJ. Frank was chair and later treasurer on MEDAC's Board of Trustees, just stepping down in 2017. Um, yeah, I will hand over to you, Frank. Thank you very much, Sarah. I hope people can hear me. Um, but before we actually uh, go to the main meeting itself, when we were, just to recall, when we began planning this webinar many months ago, we didn't know that we'd be delivering it at a time of such high tension. So before we start, I must express our grief over what's happening in what my parents used to call, back in the 1950s, the Holy Land. Anger and despair at the accelerating cycle of violence that is happening there is natural and understandable. And MedAct is among those calling for an immediate ceasefire over Gaza. There are global implications as health should be restored to a diverse world where tools of peace achieve far more than tools of war, such as nuclear warheads, of which Israel may actually have up to 400. Although Israel's official policy is nuclear ambiguity, admitting capability but not possession, Independence intelligence and some indiscretion by Israeli officials reveals that Israel is deploying plutonium warheads and crews and ballistic missiles. Nevertheless, Israel's conventional arsenal has already succeeded, tragically, in making it look like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nevertheless, Israel's nuclear arsenal possesses a significant global risk, although I note that one of their ministers is in trouble for suggesting that nukes be used in Gaza and has been dismissed. This webinar is meant to give folks an opportunity to learn more about the nuclear industry and particularly the dangers of its militarization. So I hope that at least some of you have seen and possibly even read the accompanying 8,000 word briefing on our website. This is rather more comprehensive than what I will be presenting today on the other hand, there will be opportunities for you to ask questions. There are actually two breaks, um, roughly 15 minutes and 30 minutes into the into the delivery. And then I hope there'll be enough time afterwards for a longer pause for questions. But I hope that the webinar and the briefing will be informative. So on to the slides. I want to, this is the stuff that is really driving the new industries. But there are two sorts that are dug up out of the ground in its natural form. More than 99% of it is 238 uranium. 
and less than one percent of it is two p five. But it's that less than one percent that really drives a nuclear industry because that's the stuff that is naturally fissile. And uh, we'll come on to that in a minute, what that actually means. It is very much dependent upon the existence of this small fraction of uranium in the Earth's crust. In order to be used, it has to be mined out of that crust. And most of the radioactivity is left behind. Because while the uranium has been there for the last, since the Earth was formed four billion years ago, the uranium has actually been decaying in its radioactivity. And where it was, there is left behind lots of shorter-lived radioactive isotopes. And when the uranium is mined and removed, about 80% of the radioactive is left behind. It then has to be enriched, the uranium, in order to be used. And after being used, it needs to be cleared of waste products during production and after use. So it's a messy stuff to deal with. Uranium enrichment is needed for all sorts of purposes, but the main ones are this. To power nuclear power plants, which needs up to 4% enrichment, the newest nuclear submarine engines up to 20%, and nuclear weapons virtually pure. But that process leaves depleted uranium, which nevertheless is used by the industry, either as penetrator around the course, because being so heavy, it's very penetrative, it can also be prepared in sheet form to armor plate the tanks. And also, it is used in nuclear weapons um, as a tamper to keep the, the very rapid reactions uh, in, the, in, the, in the bomb under some sort of delay so that it maximizes the actual reactivity of the bomb. But depleted uranium is toxic. And also, when it's fired and hits things, it bursts into flames. Um, therefore, is very undesirable. It's as biochemically toxic, particularly to we, to kidneys. So, what is fission? The next few slides will explain what that is. But the ones that we are concerned about in the industry is two three five uranium and its derivative two three nine plutonium, which we will talk about very soon. This is the normal reaction of uranium in bulk to uh, to undergo spontaneous fission. So you can see at the top there that a U235 nucleus on taking a, a, a neutron will very quickly split fission into two fairly large fragments and a lot of neutrons as well. And some of those neutrons will hit other 235 uranium nuclei, which also split, but some will also split, uh, hit 238 uranium nuclei, which turn it into plutonium, and which then also splits into fragments. So those are, uh, uh, that's the basis of fission and why it's so important, because those flashes are enormous energy bursts at each fission. And it was plutonium that fueled the Fat Man bomb on Nagasaki and is used in most modern nuclear warheads today. So although no plutonium exists naturally on Earth, it is only derived from industrial nuclear uh, processes from power, power, power plants, it is very much favored because it's lighter uh, than uh, uranium and has a lower critical mass, explodes more easily, and the explosion from it is more powerful than from uranium. But we get it from spent fuel in nuclear reactors from which it can be chemically removed and processed. The place in Britain where most of it is processed is Sellafield, up on the Cumbrian coast. And this is an aerial photograph taken about 20 years ago, showing the extent of the site and the sort of facilities that are there. But Sellafield is an active place still, mainly for processing the nuclear waste and making it into a form that can be stored. But unfortunately, there is no way yet devised whereby nuclear waste can be stored for a long time. At the same time, Sellafield is undergoing decommissioning. That means the idea is to return it to a, an uncontaminated site, but they will take at least 100 years. And in the past, nearby Sellafield at uh, Calder Hall was a nuclear power generation plant. And as I said earlier, it is the place where we reprocess spent nuclear fuel into plutonium. 
and we now have enough plutonium to make well over 20,000 Nagasaki type bombs. So going back to a nuclear power plant, the plants that were developed at uh, Golden Hall were not this design. This is a more uh, 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 frequently used and still being built in places, pressurized water reactor. And you can see from here that on the left side, we've got the, pre the, the pressure vessel uh, with the fuel elements and control rods around which water is flowing. And the water is doing two things. It's getting heated, but at the same time, it's contributing to the control of the fission reactions in those rods. Then that water goes on the route into a steam generator. And you can see that that's meant to be the pipes of the very hot water um, from the reactor going through the steam generator, but obviously not mixing with it, but separately and heating it to boiling point. And the steam from there is used to make electricity in turbines. Most of these reactors were meant to last no more than 40 years, but most have been, uh, many have been, uh, have their life extended. Nevertheless, they still eventually had to be decommissioned because of the wear and tear effects of the continual radiation. Some important is that they need enormous amounts of water uh, in order to cool reactors and supply the steam, and that has profound ecological consequences. The reactor rods need to be replaced every 18 months or so because they get uh, they get so saturated with fission products that they interfere with the efficiency. They then need to be removed and kept safe, as I've said earlier, but there's no really safe place to keep them for any long time. Breaches in power plants have occurred, indeed, at Calder Hall in 1956, um, and therefore protection is required. And in these days of terrorist attacks, particularly in Ukraine, not so much terrorist but, uh, attacks by either side, but probably Russia more, on the Zaporizhia reactors, uh, could release more radiation and contaminate more of the environment than occurred at Chernobyl. And that's the correct spelling, by the way. Nuclear power plants cannot be turned off in a flash. That's a very important characteristic. Even if the turbine is stopped, the reactor elements continue fissioning. And at Chernobyl, under the sarcophagus, there is still reactions generating radioactivity. So you can't switch them off in a flash. We now come to the phenomenon of new nuclear. There is a very powerful nuclear industry lobby thus uh, uh, persuading the, the UK government that it needs more nuclear power plants. One is being built at Hinkley Point C now. That's uh, due to open in about five years' time. It's already been very profoundly delayed. Another HPC-type reactor is proposed in Sizewell. That, even if it all goes well, that probably won't open for 10, 15 years. And then there's the alternative, what's called small modular reactors that are being touted because they're said to be small, cheap, and easy to build. But such claims are very controversial, and even some in the nuclear industry dispute the case for SMRs. They're not so small, not so cheap. They are still risks from the nuclear cycle, the mining, etc. Many of us um, believe they're not needed because renewables offer a quicker and cheaper alternative. I think that's true, but nevertheless, we mustn't be uh, we must be aware that renewables, particularly for battery storage, require um, rare earth metals, which also need to be mined, and there could be profound ecological consequences from that unless care is taken. But my biggest concern about the the civil uh, um, industry in this regard for SMRs is the dependency on the military industry because Rolls Royce is being touted for the civil SMRs because they've got expertise in building engines, uh, uh, nuclear engines and submarines. So very briefly on nuclear fusion, the revival of claims for generating electricity from controlled nuclear fusion is really for the birds at the moment. There's no real prospect that could come online anytime soon. So for the purposes of further discussion here, I would be, uh, I, I suggest we did dismiss that. And at this point, we can have a few minutes for questions if anybody's got something to raise from what's been said so far. So let's continue with the- Could I, 
Could I just ask a question? Yes, of course. Yes, go ahead. Reza. Sorry about that. Um, uh, with respect to the uh, continuation of uh, power throughout the winter times and in the daily cycle of light and darkness, uh, some of the uh, some of the people in the industry are touting that nuclear is one of the solutions to have that steady state supply of energy. I'm sure that is not the case, but I was just wondering whether you could uh, shed some more light on that. Well, the, 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 it is a valid point. The sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow, although quite often when the sun is not shining, the wind is blowing. But nevertheless, this is a, a, a well uh, is a well established question. And the answer has got to be storage of the electricity in some form. And that's where the batteries are being proposed. Um, and there is a huge amount of research and newer batteries are being uh, uh, developed, which would be A, more efficient and B, possibly less damaging to the environment. But it is a very valid question. And we need to address that in order, if we are going to make very much more available um, of the renewable electricity. I think we have a question from Bimal question. and then one question from Michael in the chat, which I can read. But Bimal, if you want to go first quickly. Yeah, no, thank you, Frank. Um, I was much more interested in new nuclear. I mean, uh, is it uh, economically viable? Are the uh, political leaders um, willing to invest money? As we could see, the access to railway had been shutted down because of the financial issues and all those things. Will, will new nuclear definitely going to take lift off? Thank you. Well, one of the problems about new, new nuclear is that it will take ages to come in. And we need a solution for the climate change problem and electricity supply much more quickly than the time frame for building new, new nuclear. And that goes for the SMRs as well. They are not cheap. They are much more expensive than renewables. Although there is a question at the moment that renewables are being disadvantaged in the market because while inflation is going up um, and the fossil fuels are relatively cheaper, um, they are beginning to compete with the costs for of uh, renewables, but that I think is a short term situation. And there is there could be so much more, particularly for uh, uh, offshore, but even onshore wind. So uh, that 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 would be it, it is a recognised problem. Um, but I uh, I still feel that there is so much against nuclear because it's very powerful links with the military that we should be avoiding it as much as possible. Thanks very much, Frank. And then there was just one final question from Michael at this stage, which says, are there any models for waste storage that are successful and not dangerous? No, <laughs> <laughs> I think I can say that. There was a pit um, in, in, in America that blew up because it was badly designed. There is a facility in Finland that does look as if it could be good, but it's only for Finland. And what we are wanting is vast amounts of storage space. Um, and there's no place for that in Britain so far. So I think basically the answer is not yet, if not actually no. OK, I think I really am going to continue with um, uh, the progress here. So this is what we are going to do for the rest of this webinar. And just go through what nuclear weapons are. There are three types, efficient, which is the type used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as I say, uranium for Hiroshima, two twenty for Nagasaki. Boost efficient, which it makes, which is a bit more efficient and uses makes better use of efficient. Because actually, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, only a very small amount of fuel actually efficient. And then we've got the super thermonuclear, which is designed for the very large bombs. A small, an, an initial fission triggers a very high yield fusion reaction, and this is uncontrolled. And the difficulty with fusion electricity is of controlling the fusion, and that's what's really proving so difficult. So thermonuclear uh, uses uh, fusion high yield, but in an uncontrolled way. This uh, is what Tim was asking about. This is a picture of the actual Nagasaki bomb, weighing four and a half tons, and in the middle of that swollen belly is a perfect sphere packed with high explosive, and right in the middle, like a stone in a cherry or a plum, is what they call the pit. And that pit, in this case, is of plutonium. 
And it's there in such a way that when the explosives rounded are, are ignited into an, an instantaneous implosion, there is so much pressure put on the plutonium that it goes into fission. So that's how it works in a nutshell. That within the plutonium, there is what they call a neutron charger. Um, and even in 1944-45, the scientists were clever enough to know what could uh, uh, enhance the issue of neutrons to set off the bomb. So that is the early form of, uh, of free-fall bombing. This is a nuclear warhead has got two bits. On the far left, bottom left, is the equivalent of boosted fission bomb in which there is some fusion fuel called deuterium deuterium gas you can see on the left up there. And that when that goes, it issues so many um, radiation, X rays and other neutrons that it activates as the secondary thermonuclear device in the middle of which is also some fusion fuel in the form of lithium deuteride. And what that does, when that is irradiated, that it spontaneously produces the mix of lithium and, uh, uh, sorry, of deuterium and tritium to produce a fusion fuel. Then on the outside of that, there is what they call a tamper, the uranium around it, which can be even depleted uranium, because that is still as good at containing the bomb for a few microseconds to maximize the explosion. But also, under those conditions, that uranium, even though it's not 235, will add to fission, making it even more efficient as, a, as an explosion. So those are the main devices that are used these days, or not, not used, but designed these days uh, for nuclear weapons. So here we have a demonstration of the fusion reaction involving deuterium and tritium. On the top left, we have deuterium, 2H, and next to it, tritium, 3H, which under the thermonuclear conditions are fused with a flash that shows the, the explosion and the products of helium, helium-4, which is the same as an alpha particle, and a neutron. So those are the principles of the fusion reaction that is behind the thermonuclear weapon. So the yield of nuclear weapons is expressed in equivalents of millit uh, in equivalents of, of tons of TNT, a thousand tons a kiloton or million tons a megaton. Uh, bombs now vary in yield between less than a kiloton. You may wonder what that's for, but we'll be coming on that in a minute. To very large ones, that's fifty million tons. But um, actually, in practice. Those big ones are not so good as lots of smaller bombs um, exploding of a wider area, which cause more damage. So what happens in a nuclear detonation? Here's a picture of one. I quite like this picture because it's got a nice clear outline. There's a mushroom at the top, and there's the earth being sucked into it. And you can imagine a wind from the left, say, blowing over it, will tilt it over so that you can already see fallout coming from the mushroom and that will fall out onto the land in the shadow of the, of, of the uh, detonation. And what happens in, is in, in the, after it's been detonated, firstly, a highly radioactive flash, seen as white light by observers, and then a longer lasting, intensely hot fireball. And that's roughly the distribution of energy in the bomb that comes from the, um, uh, the, the energy of the Einstein equation, the E equals mc squared, because every time there is a, a fission, the weight of the fission products is slightly less than that of the original, and the re reduced weight is that which is converted into energy. Fireballs are the ground, ground burst reduces the fallout, um, and that will contaminate the land beneath for weeks months or even years. Air bursts uh, produce less fallout because they don't suck up the ground directly, but the blast is amplified by bouncing off the ground and producing a boom-boom effect. And the flash from a very high altitude detonation releases a powerful wave of photons, that's not protons, that's photons, light particles, gamma rays, which produce this EMP, electromagnetic pulse, which damages electronic devices across borders and severely disrupts communications. 
So we need to look at what happens if lots of bonds are used as in a hostile exchange. So this is a rather complicated slide, but don't worry too much about the detail. Shows the history of how many warheads the world had at particular times. Over the far left, we've got the era when Russian, UK, France, and China tested their bombs. Um, and the, uh, until 1962, most of those tests were in the atmosphere and contaminating the high atmosphere. Then as we go on, the further, further tests until 1996, when the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty came in, that's what the last arrow on the right shows, and that you'll see there how many were owned by, were, were from Russia and from America. And on the far right, you've got the current stock of those arsenals. And how are they delivered? Well, they're delivered either by direct by flights or they're delivered by rockets or missiles. And the ranges of delivery are defined as short or mid or long, according to those definitions, long being intercontinental. There were rockets and even torpedoes, naval torpedoes, which were nuclear chips. And that was the problem at Cuba in 1990, 1962. And then among the missiles, they're classified broadly into two types, crews, which are low altitude to escape um, radar detection, subsonic, and they're guided accurately to their targets by programs. And then there's ballistic, which is like throwing a stone, but supersonically from a, 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 a missile in the first phase. Um, and they are guided by gyroscopes or by wireless uh, uh, signals to their uh, uh, targets, etc. So ballistic has been described as being analogous to firing a bullet from a gun, but the bullet knows where it's going. So this is what we use the uh, one missile, multi-stage, when it goes up beyond the atmosphere, discharging its stages. It then divides into multiple re-entry vehicles. So this is called the multiple intercontinental independently targeted re-entry re vehicles. And you can see that from one missile fired, for example, from silo, which we'll be talking about in a minute, you can have several, up to 10 or so, targeted on an area much more effectively uh, than one big nuclear weapon. And the platforms in which they are can be launched with land, sea, or air, land from silos, large pits built into the ground, or mobile launchers, sea from submarines, um, and air from aircraft. I should comment about going back to the torpedoes, which you might have seen, is that the, the is, Israel does have um, submarines. Uh, they're not nuclear, they're diesel-driven, but they apparently have been loaded with nuclear warheads. Um, then there's the also the possibility, as I say, of submarines having torpedoes uh, and uh, nuclear tipped, and Israel may well have such torpedoes as well. Air, direct free falling, as in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, even these days designed for these so-called B-6112 bombs, uh, which are uh, designed to be bunker busters. And therefore, you can also get missiles launched by aircraft. And these include the latest hypersonic glide vehicles to outmaneuver air defenses. And they're being developed by both the Americans and the Russians. Uh, so do offer a, a, an increased threat. The problem with all this, we need to go through this a little bit carefully about the politics. We have strategic uses, which is the traditional, if I could put it that way, um, basis of deterrence, mutually assured destruction, a very suitable acronym there. The problems with deterrence include the fallibilities, mistakes, wrong intelligence, misreading of warnings, reliance on AI, rogue actors. Some people say that Putin is a rogue, a rogue actor, but I, I, he's much more subtle than that, I think. But other dissidents and other terrorists, terrorists not answerable to international law in any way, then the, all the nuclear weapon states are keen on making their nuclear weapons more efficient. So they are under constant development, and the idea is that to is make a nuclear war winnable by, for example, hypersonic missiles, stealth submarines, better targeting, better missile defense systems, ballistic missile defense systems, um, all designed to make it more difficult for 
on, on enemy attack to work and therefore allow you to respond and win the, in the end. A very dangerous uh, concept. Then we have the tactical uses. This is this was developed, the idea developed in the Cold War, a limited number of weapons on a limited number of sites and possibly of lower um, yield. So a few kilotons, up to 10 or 20 perhaps. But the targets would not be cities, but battlefields, maybe ports, um, and certainly power plants, including nuclear power plants. And then the other way that the uh, uh, great powers with their nuclear weapons are using them politically is as a form of bluff. Then there is the question of no first use. If all the nuclear weapon states said, we will never be the first to use them, you can see that the world could think itself more safe in a safer place. But the trouble with that is trust. And basically, Russia, United States, UK, and France have refused to endorse a no first use policy. And then there's the idea of nuclear ambiguity. And that means that these days, someone being targeted with missiles doesn't necessarily know whether they've got nuclear warheads or conventional warheads. And that has been that's been proposed as a, a strategy in uh, uh, it, by the big powers to make it more difficult for an attack nation to know what's coming its way. The other form of nuclear ambiguity is what's practiced by the Israelis. They will not admit to being a nuclear power, um, but uh, what they so, so they're reserving a case for being ambiguous about whether they want. So. I love this slide. It's an old one, uh, February 1987, the medical campaign against nuclear weapons. It's national newsletter number 18. But if you look at what it says there, um, it's a certain amount of deja vu. Patients are left waiting in the never uh, never waiting rooms, shortage of hospital beds, etc. So the sun uh, sometimes has nothing new under the sun. So here we have a series of slides on nuclear winter. The first one here shows the principle of what we believe will cause a nuclear winter. It must be remembered that when nuclear weapons were tested in the 60s, 50s and 60s and 70s, they were tested over deserts and oceans and unpopulated areas. It caused enough devastation as it was, but it didn't involve obviously cities. We do have the experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, but after that, uh, the effects of the weapons on cities have not been obviously uh, um, examined in great detail. But this is what we feel would happen now in this current understanding, including the climate science and the modelings, of the effects of detonations of nuclear weapons over cities and other uh, installations. There will be so much soot thrown into the atmosphere that sunlight will be obscured, not just for a few days or weeks, but for years. And as a consequence, people would die of starvation because of crop failures. The first phase, obviously, would be uh, the direct effects on the populations in the countries affected. And that could be in uh, um, several millions. But the long-term effects of the, global, of the crop failures uh, globally would be far more severe. So you can see in the table that there is a gradation, an increase of the effects of, uh, of the nuclear winter with the effects of more weapons, more powerful weapons being detonated. But the important thing is that even the bottom one, the 4,400 weapons of 100 kilotons each, is only a small fraction of the world's arsenal. Um, so that is uh, uh, um, an important point to remember. There are actually probably about 12,000 weapons in the stockpile at the moment. Um, so even this, although we call it all deployed weapons, this is still only a part of the total world inventory. So that is a, a, a very important thing to remember. And a survey taken in early 2023 of the British public showed how ignorant the public was unaware of these effects. So among other things, we have to make it more people more aware of the impact of a nuclear winter if a nuclear war were to break out. 
even relatively small, but even uh, but at the high levels, the very severe effects. 5.3 billion people, that's about uh, 60% of the world population, would die of starvation two years after an outbreak of a war on that scale. So, and the last slide we've got shows the contours uh, of um, the studies that were revealed back in 2016, um, between, again, a war between India and Pakistan. And you can see from this the vast areas of the world that would be badly affected by the temperature drop and therefore the cold failures, uh, the, 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 the cold experiences, and um, both on the, whether the bombs have dropped in June or August or in December to February. Clearly there is a seasonal effect, but in either case, there are profound effects on the temperature and therefore the crop growth. Crop growth. So radiation and health, this is the other really important bits which we should be concentrating on. And we are slipping in time, so I really want to go through this uh, not too quickly, but slowly enough for you to, to uh, uh, appreciate what's going on. A very brief reference to Alice Stewart, who did point out the dangers of uh, uh, irradiating abdominal x-rays to pregnant women and the effect on their babies. Um, that was pioneering work, um, and uh, uh, people are now not prepared to take chances in their timing of when women who are pregnant should or should not have an abdominal x-ray. But doses of are measured in sequence, which is an energy unit. And it should be pointed out that we are living in a natural background environment of about 2.7 millisieverts per year from each of us, half of which comes from radon 222 from the ground, which although very short-lived is constantly being generated from granite areas and gets into the air of homes and therefore adds to the clinical risk. Although natural, such doses are can damage living organisms and, in the, and induce genetic mutations, but at a very low rate. And just for reference purpose, a single modern abdominal x-ray gives a dose of about 0.70. And this is a table by the, drawn up by the International Commission on Radiation Protection in very broad terms. Doses from low to high are associated with correlated degrees of risk, very low dose, very low risk, high dose at the bottom, very distinct risk. And on populations, you will observe over time more cancer cases than there would be um, otherwise. So that's the, that, that table is also in the briefing, so you can refer to that. So this slide shows the tragic effects of lethal radiation. Um, and this is really from a victim of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, in August 1945. This was a young Japanese soldier who actually was only lightly injured by the detonation itself. But the blast did cause minor injuries, but what was really the problem was he was exposed to a high dose of radiation. He was only in a wooden house, which didn't protect him at all from the effects of radiation, even though the bomb was a kilometer away. So he did receive care for gashes on his back, and they seemed to be okay. But some days later, um, he started losing his hair, and then his gums started bleeding, and he couldn't drink, became because of the pain uh, and the continuous blood loss. He lost consciousness. That would be almost a month after the bomb, and he died on the 3rd of September. So this was the life story of a young man um, caught up in the effects of the bomb, and these are the radiation deaths, although, of course, there were also people who suffered uh, injuries, physical, um, as he did lightly, and so those people were immediately affected and had a very poor chance of survival. If we go to the next slide, we can see that there are really important guidelines from the International Commission on Radiological Profession Protection, and basically, um, in the nuclear industries now, they want the exposure doses right, that the nuclear workers are exposed to to be no more than 20 millisieverts per year, averaged over the five years. In other words, over five years of working in the nuclear industry, 
they should be exposed to no more than 100 millisieverts. Now, that is still a lot because the background, as I think we said earlier, is about two to three millisieverts a year. And so we're talking here about a sort of 50-fold increase in the amount of radiation that they would get. Um, and some would even then, re some of us would regard that as being really rather tricky. But they, there is a little bit of a provision there, and that if if a person is exposed in one of those five years to 50 millisieverts, then they can continue working so long as they are, the doses they're exposed to are vastly reduced. So over the course of the five years, it's no more than a thousand. This is a little bit of a difficult concept, but basically what they're trying to do is limit the risk of long-term effects of the radiation um, to nuclear workers. Uh, and it must be said that um, most of them will be able to survive their period of, of employment, um, but nevertheless, there is an increased risk. And I think the next slide will show you a, 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 an idealized picture of the problem, the nature of the problem. This slide has no numbers attached to it, so it's purely a model slide, but it has now been pretty well vindicated. On the uh, uh, ordinates on the left, we've got the numbers of cancers, the cancer rate. And uh, to the left, we, to the right, we've got the radiation dose increasing. And we've got a little picture there of the low dose range, whatever that may be. Now, there is a natural occurrence level of cancers, which is shown by the green line, but the radiation will add to that. And that's shown by the red line going up diagonally. So this is called the linear no threshold model. And it uh, was a subject of some debate and is still a subject of some debate, but that's the model that the ICRP work on. The reason why we can be increasingly confident that this is a valid model is shown on the next slide, which shows real data of a major studies um, by using the workers of Britain, France, and America, nuclear workers, over the years. Uh, and the important point about that is that these workers were wearing badges, which indicated how much radiation they're exposed to. And so we can work out the cumulative dose as well as the relative rate of cancers. And we've got real life data with those dots. Now, like all real life data, it's not smooth. Um, and the, the data between 200 and 300 is lower. And we have to accept that you know, that's the genuine finding. But the line that you've got there goes through all the ranges of probabilities about that risk. So that really is a pretty good demonstration of the support for the linear no-dose uh, uh, um, hypothesis. So that's... That's the, the basis of the ICRP protection. And if we go to the next slide, we have to admit that it is not universally accepted. There are still people who feel that a little bit of radiation does no harm. And there are also people on the other side who think that a little bit of radiation is particularly dangerous. Well, there's no real evidence epidemiologically for either of those studies. So consequently, that's I think validates the caution of the of the ICRP, and the final slide just gives a cautionary note, because in the UK, the incidence that's the number of cases diagnosed each year of cancers, including childhood leukemias, is about three hundred eighty thousand people each year get newly diagnosed with cancers, of which about six hundred six hundred thirty are childhood leukemias. These are not necessarily caused by ionizing radiation. Other environmental causes predominate. And the main, for cancers as a whole, the main environmental uh, uh, cause is still smoking, smoking nicotine, smoking cigarettes. Um, as far as radiation is concerned, the risks do increase with higher doses of radiation and also with age. As we age, we are more likely to get cancer. Um, and that's because both age and the re ionizing radiation are associated with damage to the cell's DNA, the genetic damage by oxidants. Um, so consequently, the cause of the damage, whether it's radiation or cell metabolism, is oxidation. 
That is a, 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 a metabolic um, normality. We live because we oxidize our food and therefore the oxidizing process, cells are exposed to all the time. And there is always a little bit of leak of that and it goes to the DNA and it causes damage. And there's a very well developed biochemical process of repair in pretty well all organisms because we've grown up in a, a planet where there is radiation as well as the cell repair processes as well as some oxidant damage. So both act as a damage to the DNA. And in both cases, there are very good repair mechanisms. But every now and then, the repair is faulty. And therefore, the DNA is not stitched together in its normal way. This sometimes, not always by any means, but occasionally will result in an altered DNA that could be called an oncogene, which means a DNA that would be producing products that cause cancer. Uh, so we must recognize that although radiation is a well-established cause of leukemias and cancers, um, the vast majority, even today, is caused by the normal process of living. Um, and so consequently, we should get this in proportion. Nevertheless, we still ought to do our very best to minimize the extra amount of radiation to which we are exposed, um, whether we work in the nuclear industry or not. Nuclear medicine, we are indebted to nuclear reactors for providing isotopes for our clinical use, but they are not necessarily to be necessary to make them nu nuclear reactors. These linear accelerators that have been around for ages have also, uh, in some cases, largely taken over the source of these clinical use of materials. So we don't know, need radioactive uh, radio. Uh, uh, reactors for that purpose either. Now, we come to an important part, uh, which I do want to get over as quickly as possible. The treaties are, are been, have been devised over the years, both by the United Nations and bilateral ones. These are the four main ones uh, under the United Nations. The Parcel Nuclear Test Ban back in 1963, which avoided test, ban uh, test materials and large quantities get into the atmosphere. The comprehensive test ban was somewhat later and is not yet in force, but actually um, when somebody tests a nuclear weapon, that can be detected by the sensitive seismic uh, um, monitoring for earthquakes. And so we know when uh, tests have been conducted. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, I will talk about in a minute, goes back to 1968, 1970, we actually in force. And then much more recently, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. There's also the uh, advisory opinion back in 1996 of the Inter International Court of Justice, which we were all very pleased about at the time, but there was a loophole. Um, that if loophole in extreme external circumstance of self-defense, that effectively blows a whole hole in the, in the ICJ's uh, advisory opinion. So... So basically, nobody takes any notice of it anymore. The bilateral treaties between the USA and Russia um, really went a long way. And it's a very sad state that we're in now, whereby um, uh, uh, Russia and uh, Russia is suspending its participation in the START treaty. Um, and it's also just recently announced it won't participate in the CTBT. That doesn't really matter in a way so much, but as a signal, it's very important to show that there is a decreasing compliance by Russia with international, with bilaterally agreed treaties. So the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, is essentially a bargain between the five states. In time, the nuclear weapon states will disarm in good faith, so-called, while the non-nuclear weapon states won't arm, won't arm, but they would be allowed to develop civil nuclear power under control. And the aim is to stop countries from developing their own nuclear arsenal, widely regarded as being successful by the uh, nuclear powers at any rate, although four, those four, have developed their own arsenal in spite of the NPT, which they have not signed up to. And North Korea actually withdrew from it. So that's the effect of the NPT. Uh, the Americans already had enough. 
But the Russians went on building on theirs until 1987, when the Reagan-Gorbachev talks were followed by a miraculous decline of Russian production. Um, during the Cold War uh, and since the NPT, many non-nuclear weapon states became increasingly concerned that the nuclear war was getting more and more likely. So they formed the international campaign against to, to abolish nuclear weapons, uh, which is actually held by IPW, the, the medical one. Um, and they won a Nobel Prize. Um, and that led the UN General Assembly to draft the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which came into force two years ago. This is what it's based on. Prohibits the best testing, production, stockpiling, stationing, transfer, use, and threat of use of nuclear weapons. And it provides a time-bound framework for those who sign up to it, if they've already, if they still got nuclear weapons. So in theory, we UK could ratify it, so long as it's immediately followed by disarmament. Uh, an unlikely scenario, but nevertheless, it is a facility that could be provided by the TPNW. Final comments. Nuclear war remains aggravated by deteriorating global security in the face of environmental degradation, the climate crisis, and the demands of an increasing world population. And once started, even by tactical use of nuclear weapons, it will be difficult to limit it for a major crisis develops. Indeed, the prospect of human annihilation cannot be discounted. And the nuclear and climate crises augment each other. This is very important. But while the climate crisis is becoming more apparent, the nuclear crisis remains below the headlines for most people. While a substantial number of citizens, especially of the nuclear weapon states and their allies, consider that deterrence is keeping them safe, global security would be better served by a comprehensive welfare system across the world, which is free of nuclear weapons. And this organization, Rethinking Security, is a, a, a splendid organization to which MedAct is affiliated, and that is something that very much uh, gives an idea of how we could develop a way of being more secure, but not dependent on nuclear deterrence. And wouldn't it be nice if we were able to end up with this night of Gorbachev and Reagan signing the INF Treaty in 1987. So that's all I want to say at the moment, and we can go for certain questions. There are one or two slides um, which detail what can be done, um, but they are also in the briefing. So uh, go to the briefing, which will also be sent to you to see the ideas of what can be done. I'm prepared to open the, to the floor for more questions for maybe the 10 minutes or so, if we could go that far. Thanks very much. So questions. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, yeah, just brilliant to hear such a comprehensive overview of such a broad and sprawling issue um, that obviously you've been involved in working and campaigning on for a really long time. So really helpful. Um, and I wonder, yeah, if we have any questions to hand at the moment. We've had a few so far. There are a couple I can see. Uh, I'll pass, I'll pass to you. I'll pass on I'll the first. Pass. Matthew, if you heard, feel free to ask a question. It's from there, Hi there, Frank. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, thanks very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering how you... Uh, I'm very sympathetic to this uh, idea of... Um, uh, of considerable risk of nuclear war. But it, I think it is sometimes quite difficult to get across that idea to people um, who are inclined to say, well, no one would ever press the button. They haven't pressed the button for 75 years. Um, they will just find other ways to de-escalate um, um, if there is a particular crisis. Um, no, no individual, no president would be rational enough to make such a terrible mistake. Um, I know that there are answers to that because there, are, for for instance, there are um, uh, there have been various close calls and accidents. But I was wondering um, how you, with uh, more experience than I have in this field, um, go about answering that question, um, or do you think there there is actually that the, the risk is actually relatively low? Um, uh, 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 yeah, I was just wondering on your thoughts on that.
Thank you. Um, I, I, um, I, I did refer early on to the fact that a minister in the Israeli government has been sacked because he advocated bombing Gaza with nuclear weapons. So you may be right in thinking that even Netanyahu wouldn't actually let loose and that these yeah. weapons are all for bluff. Um, however, I would say that we are observing on the whole a rightward trend in world politics. Although there are occasional shifts to the left, we are seeing more and more autocratic rule. And there are, uh, there is a fear of terrorists, perhaps not detonating a full nuclear device, device but um, a, a bombing uh, 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 like nuclear power plants, that is certainly a um, and other situations in which there could be what might be called nuclear irresponsibility. And um, I think it's definitely going to be an increasing risk, where in 2023, it may be a miracle that we've got here, but I am not very confident about surviving the rest of this century without there being a nuclear war of some sort. It could be that there would be a local nuclear war and people would come to their senses, but there is so much hate in the world at the moment and it's getting worse. And there are people being so emotionally charged by that hatred that I think that the very existence of nuclear weapons, it will be a great temptation great temp to someone who might actually have access to them. And that's my answer for that particular point. Thanks, Frank, and thanks, Matthew, for that question. Um, I'll pass on now to Bimal. You also have a hand. Um, thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you, Frank. It was really, um, I would say, a uh, whole life of experience of yours in the nuclear disarmament movement, maybe 50, 60 years of it. Um, I do have uh, two questions, one a bit of technical ones. These days, we do have a modernization of nuclear weapons. Recently, I realized that it's only the warhead the nuclear warhead that they are replacing it and modernizing it rather than the whole set of all the bombs. Um, and, so and, and the missiles. And the missiles. Missiles uh, are being uh, modernized uh, too. Mm -hmm. Maybe could you give it a bit of more uh, information regarding the B61 and the lake and heat stuff? And the second one was the, regarding the emergency preparedness either through the um, man-made disaster or through some form of uh, era or uh, AIs in the future having a nuclear catastrophe, do you think any nuclear weapon state is uh, really prepared for it, for the emergency preparedness? As you could see, most of the nuclear weapon state had a higher casualties or many people died of COVID and they weren't prepared for the pandemic. Are they prepared for the nuclear war or the nuclear catastrophe? Thank you. Linking the pandemic with the uh, uh, nuclear catastrophe. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a very good point. Uh, I think what the COVID pandemic has shown is complacency and lack of preparedness in spite of there being ample scientific warning that the one was on the cards. And I think there's an analogy there in that we need also to be prepared to deal with the likelihood of, um, uh, of an outbreak of nuclear war by preventing it. That's what we're all about. We're preventing it by actually eliminating the existence of nuclear weapons. Um, your earlier point about um, the uh, B, B6112 for Lake and Heath, etc. Well, that bomb is smaller in size, but more penetrating and more accurate to be delivered. So consequently, um, it is a refined bunker buster and therefore increasing the possibility of it being used because it's more efficient. So it would be very tempting to use the B-51-12, uh, uh, B-61-12 um, flight and, uh, and launch of that, uh, 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 um, of, of that bomb. So, that's basically the problem. And that is, again, it's part of this race to improve, to make more credible the, your existence of nuclear arsenal. And the more credible it becomes, the more likely it is to be used. So I'm pretty, pretty pessimistic that while we've still got even a lowish amount compared with the peak of 1980 nuclear weapons in the world, 
some will eventually be used. That's my answer. Thank you again, Frank, and thank you, Bimal, for those questions. We have two more. Reza, you have your hand raised, and then we have one more in the chat. So I'll hand over to Reza, and then I'll offer our final question before we close. Someone got a question? Reza, can you still use your microphone? Apologies. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. So, so that's just two two part question. One about the theater sized nuclear weapons that has been branded around for the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, there were some talks either by Russia or America that uh, these these new nuclear size, uh, theater sized weapons are being developed and could be used in a limited numbers. And the other thing is the issue of uh, the probabilities. If we did get rid of all the nuclear weapons from Russia and uh, other nuclear powers, what would be the, the uh, in your opinion, the, uh, the likelihood of massive conventional wars, such as what we did experience uh, in First and Second World War? Yeah. Well, so, so I think I've got your question right. Firstly, um, there are concepts uh, of uh, um, hyper missiles that are so, so fast, hyper hypersonic, and they are being developed. Um, and Russia is claiming to do that. I don't think they've actually developed fully yet, um, but there is still enough worry and concern that they are under development and could actually pose a threat. I mean, this is the whole point. Um, the nuclear powers don't want to settle down into a nice happy balance of um, threatening each other but never using them. They are constantly developing them. And the hypersonic missiles that I think you're referring to are being seem to be being developed by Russia in particular. Um, uh, but it's not exactly clear how fast and how far they're going with that. It's all part of this very difficult bluff. Um, but uh, I, th I think that's the point which I've been trying to make. Uh, but there is a concern that these hypersonic missiles will be developed, and it's all part of parcel of breaking the, uh, 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 the, the comfortable existence, coexistence of nuclear powers, having nuclear weapons, but not using them. That is a delusion. They are likely to be used the more and more sophisticated they get. I hope that answers your point. Yes, thank you. Um, and the second part was about the likelihood of uh, massive uh, 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 international war uh, of conviction, uh, convention uh, if we have a total absence of nuclear weapons. Well, I think this is a very important point, uh, and I utterly sympathize with that. Take away all the nuclear weapons, have no nuclear weapons, and let people fight out with conventional weapons. They may not be as big as nuclear, but they can still be horrible, and who's going to look after them? So actually, there is a real need to combine the nuclear disarmament with some form of recognition of international responsibilities. And what's going on in Israel at the moment makes one despair about the likelihood of those sort of thinking going on. But at least it wouldn't be nuclear annihilation. Um, it may be large scale uh, uh, mort morbidity and mortality, but um, at the same time, we do need to press ahead with civil non-nuclear disarmament as well. So, uh, uh, you're, I think you're right in saying that nuclear disarmament on its own won't solve the world's problems. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Frank, and thanks, Reza, for that question. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to read out our last question, which is in the chat from Osgood. Thank you for your question, uh, which says, Dear Frank, what do you think would be the consequences of a country like Turkey, for example, a signatory to the NPT and a member of NATO acquiring nuclear weapons? Um, such as sanctions or et cetera, for the country? Well, that's a good question. And countries like Turkey and Egypt and certainly um, Iran uh, are very strong candidates.
for proliferating into more nuclear weapons. Um, and indeed, uh, even places like Brazil have, have tinkered with the idea that perhaps they should be a nuclear power as well. Um, if the feeling that having nuclear weapons will give them some sort of extra security. Um, so the non-proliferation team are trying very hard, I mean, in the United Nations, are trying very hard to make it uh, uh, apparent that it's not worthwhile them having nuclear weapons. One approach has been to form alliances, and of course NATO is an alliance, which effectively means we've got other countries than France and America who are hosting nuclear weapons, that includes Germany, etc. So consequently, uh, it may be a bit of a myth to say that we've confined the proliferation to other countries. Um, but uh, uh, it is very important that those countries that are tempted to develop nuclear weapons get some sort of assurance that they don't need to have them. Um, it's a very fine political point, and it's one which uh, the diplomats have been wrestling really for the last six de decades as to how to uh, prevent the spread to other countries. Thank you, there, Frank. So there, there, there is a real worry at the moment about Britain and America teaming up with Australia to produce nuclear sub nuclear uh, nuclear submarines, not necessarily nuclear armed, but in a way that would proliferate the technology of um, nu nuclear technology across borders as well. So there is a real risk of proliferation. I think I better stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Frank, and for everyone for joining us. I know we have one final hand raised from Chuck of IPPNW. I wonder, Chuck, if it was a very, very short question or a final comment for Frank? Yes, it's, uh, <clears throat> well, it's relatively short, but it's right on this very topic of proliferation. And uh, I'm just wondering if Frank thinks that uh, this current crisis and the, and the, the um, uh, what, could become a, a war between uh, Hezbollah and and, uh, and Israel and uh, uh, with threats to Iran, whether at this point Iran may choose to go ahead and, and make nuclear weapons. Have they already decided to, to make nuclear weapons? And if they do, uh, won't Saudi Arabia likely be doing the same thing because they're quite anxious to get nuclear technology and don't want too many restrictions on, on uh, how they use it. So um, my opinion is that we're in, at a real risk point because of, of Israel's action right now and the fact that they have impunity in that action in part because they have nuclear weapons. So I think this is really a dangerous situation, but I'm wondering what you think. Yeah, I, I think we are on the cusp of disaster. Um, the, although Israel has sacked um, a junior minister who has suggested that we that, that, that they do use um, their nuclear weapons the, uh, in this current crisis? The uh, 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 and Netanyahu has um, sacked him. Nevertheless, it must be very borderline about whether this will escalate because clearly Israel doesn't want nuclear weapons being detonated near its own territory. But when it gets to further away, like Iran or other parts, it must be much more difficult for them to, for some of them, to resist the temptation to use. And so I think that this is very definitely a proliferative risk that they've got, that we're under, that there is definitely an increased chance of them being used at the present time. So it's vital that we try to contain this dreadful happening in, in, in Gaza at the moment because it would be very possible for there to be proliferation of the event. And so consequently, we are more at more danger now of a global nuclear war than we've been in my life. That's what I think. So consequently, um, this is a very tense moment and we have to do our very best all around to dissuade the uh, proliferation of the hostilities uh, that, that are going on in Gaza at the moment. It seems highly unlikely that they can be controlled. But nevertheless, one slight glimmer of hope is that even though Biden and others are backing 
uh, um, the Israelis at this particular point, they are trying to persuade them to uh, abide by humanitarian law. I mean, to me, it seems uh, uh, very obvious that it's already been smashed. But nevertheless, there are attempts to constrain them, and we must just hope that they're able to do so. Um, so I haven't got a good answer, but it is certainly a very risky situation at the moment. And I think that um, there are people like uh, uh, um, uh, uh, who have been discussing the current risks at the moment. And in Britain, just today, there's an ex-ambassador uh, to um, uh, uh, who uh, who is actually talking about the, uh, uh, the the need to disarm to actually recognize the dangers going on in Gaza right now and to a uh, 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 pull back from that highly dangerous situation while at the same time recognizing in some form the need for Israel to the, the, the to still exist, but in a much less aggressive form. It seems almost impossible, but there are voices around the world that are trying to pour oil on this very troubled water. And I just we just have to hope that they succeed in averting what could well be a global outbreak of nuclear war in the mid, in, in that part of the world. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Chuck, for providing that question to end us on a really pertinent and really urgent question. Um, I'd like to say thanks again for everyone who joined us this evening. A little bit further up in the chat, you can find a link to join the Nuclear Weapons Group mailing list um, to stay up to date on future events and activities and potentially come to a group meeting. Um, and I think I can leave you on that note. Um, I would also encourage you, if you haven't already, to have a read through the briefing that accompanies this webinar, which, as Frank has said, is really comprehensive and includes some of the specific actions that we encourage everyone to take. So please do have a read of those. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you.